All right, it's four o'clock, so I'll get started. Uh, thank you everyone who's registered and joined. Uh, we're certainly very pleased to have you here this Sunday afternoon. I hope everyone's safe and uh, enjoying the weekend. This is Seven Seas Cruising Association, a Seven Seas University free webinar on avoiding the art of dragging, which is generously provided by our partners, Rudy and Jill Seches. And uh, Rudy and Jill, well, let me see, there's already a Q&A. Thanks for, <laughs> okay, Ed, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, Rudy and Jill are gonna be talking us through avoiding the art of dragging today for the next hour. And uh, again, this is brought to you by Seven Seas Cruising Association. For anyone who doesn't know about Seven Seas Cruising Association, we've been fostering camaraderie, knowledge, and information sharing for cruisers, as well as leaving a clean wake all the way since 1952. So you can visit us at www.ssca.org for more information. We are a nonprofit membership organization. Um, so just, to, uh, I'm going to hand off, I'm going to stop my, my screen share and I'm going to hand off to Rudy. And while he's setting up his screen share, I just want to talk you through a couple of the logistics. So Rudy, you can go ahead and um, start your screen share now. Uh, Rudy is going to be walking through his presentation. And as you can probably see at the bottom of the screen, we have a Q&A box down at the bottom. So we'll be monitoring the Q&A box. Uh, Rudy's going to go through his presentation. When I see there's a set of questions, I'm going to hand, I'm going to hold up this question mark sign for Rudy, and then at his next opportunity, he'll stop to answer the questions if it's appropriate to do so. Uh, we do have just one hour for the webinar, so we may not get to all the questions. However, Rudy is going to be kind enough to provide all of his contact information. So if there are questions that he doesn't get to, that you will be able to contact him after the workshop directly. So for those of you who um, may want to see this webinar again, it will be made available by recording. Hopefully, I do see it is recording here, um, only for the people who registered and also for anyone who is an SSCA member after the fact. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Rudy and we'll, we'll get started. Welcome, Rudy. Thank you, Cecilia. Hi, I'm Rudy Sachet, and I'll be presenting this webinar on anchoring in behalf of the SSCA. The information we're presenting today and much more is, can be found in our book, Anchoring a Ground Tackler's Apprentice. It's available as an e-book or as a hard copy. Unfortunately, we can't cover everything about anchoring in 45 minutes to an hour. So if you have questions, be sure to send them to us. Excuse me. If you want to send the questions to me afterwards, my phone number and email address will reappear on the last slide at the end of the presentation. First thing you need to do when you're anchoring is get it down. The anchor, get it down to the bottom. The recommended procedure is to position your boat, stop forward momentum, back up lowering the anchor, let out enough road to set the anchor, once the anchor is set, establish adequate scope, install a snubber or a bridle, hang your day shape and your anchor light, and if you have an electric windlass, shut off the circuit breaker. The problem with this, if it's that simple, why do so many boats drag? And that's what we're going to talk about today, is how to avoid dragging. Now, there's only a few reasons why a boat drags. Your anchor is too small. Your anchor is not in the appropriate shape for the bottom or design for the bottom, and you don't have enough scope. What's important here is each one of these do something different. They perform a different function from the other two. You have to get all three right, or at least not get any of them wrong. So let's begin with your anchors. How big should you have an anchor? In sand, <coughs> excuse me. In sand, if you go to the manufacturer sizing chart for your particular anchor, the size that they recommend is usually adequate for under 25 knots of wind. If you're going to be experiencing gale force winds, it needs to be one size bigger. That's 25 to 45 knots. If you're going to be experiencing storm force winds, 45 to 60 knot winds, your anchor needs to be two sizes bigger. The biggest comment I get about this is people saying, well, I'm not going to be in a storm or in, gale for, in the gale. 
but we're not talking gales and storms. We're talking gale force and storm force winds. The typical squall that comes through in, in uh, the summer afternoons can blow easily into the gale force, even storm force uh, levels. And if you're going to be experiencing that, it's better to have your anchor size for that ahead of time, not after the fact. In mud, you have to go up one more size from what we would use in sand. And if you have one of the older generation anchors, like a cloth or a uh, plow anchor, you should go up an additional size if you want comparable holding power as the newer generations give. But mud has a lot of idiosyncrasies that frustrates people. First of all, you know, mud, <clears throat> when you're talking about mud, you have to think in a sliding scale. You can be in mud that's really soft and oozy, or it can go all the way up to where it's very firm and dense. So when you're talking mud, you kind of have to specify where along that range uh, the mud you're talking, your, the mud you're anchoring in exists. In mud, the fluke angle is very important. Anchors designed to work in sand will also work in mud, but they won't have the same holding power. For example, the Fortress FX23, the company says will hold up to 8,000 pounds in sand, but if you put that same anchor in mud, it'll only hold 1,200 pounds. So if you change that angle to its mud setting, it'll hold 2,400 pounds. So it'll hold more with a 45 degree angle. But what you need to ask yourself, is it holding enough? So the only way you're going to know that is you, you have to go to a load table, find your size boat, the wind speed, and that will tell you what kind of load you'll have on your ground tackle. The two most common anchors that have adjustable shanks are the, I'm looking for my, Uh, um, laser pointer. Right. The two most would be the Fortress FX series, which has a sand and a mud setting, and the Supermax anchor with the adjustable shank, which has a sand and a mud setting. So just because you change your setting to mud doesn't mean your anchor is going to have enough holding power. If you don't, then you have to get a bigger anchor. Another frustration in mud is a lot of times, especially if you have an anchor with a uh, pivoting shank, the anchor will land in the mud, but the shank will sink down. And when you go to set it, it pulls up. And the way you counter that is you need to get that shank up. And you do that by <clears throat> shortening your road where you have two to three times the depth of water, which will have a tendency to pull up on the shank. And then that'll help the anchor set. Another problem is if you don't put out enough road, that's going to limit how deep the, mud, uh, the, the anchor will vary in the mud. And unless if it doesn't vary deep enough, it has less holding. I find this slide to be very tongue tying for me, so bear with me. So when you're in mud, you have to make sure once it starts to set, you have to make sure you put out enough road that it's going to dig deep enough to give you the holding power that you need. Another problem is when the anchor lands in mud, it may land upside down. Anchors with structural components that are designed to flip that anchor over or to tilt those flukes down have nothing firm to push against. So when the anchor lands upside down, it tends to stay upside down. And all you'll do is drag it through the mud upside down. Anchors that orient themselves based on weight distribution and design usually don't have that problem. And the other frustrating thing about mud is <clears throat> trying to set your anchor will often take 40, 50, or 60 feet dragging it through the mud before it finally digs deep enough to start holding. Now, there are techniques you can use to shorten that distance, 
and we list them in the book. And if anybody's interesting, they can uh, write in for a question. We'll answer it after the um, presentation is finished. But how do you know whether it's sand or mud? You look at the chart, sometimes the symbol's there, but some, most of the time it isn't. So what you need to do then is look at the shoreline. If the shore is made up of sand, then chances are the sea bottom is going to be sandy. If the shoreline is made with dirt, then chances are you're anchoring in mud. And there's a lot of places that may be a combination of both. Then you have grass, weeds, leaves, and other vegetation. Here, too, you have to apply a sliding scale. Is the vegetation very sparse, where it's easy not to anchor in the vegetation, but you're actually anchoring in the seabed? Or is it very dense, <clears throat> and no matter what you do, the anchor lands in, in the weeds? This is important because just about every anchor out there, and we studied this for seven months, one year, none of them seem to work well in weeds. And the ones that do, they hook in the weeds, not in the seabed. And that problem is the weeds have a lot less holding power than does the seabed itself. So what you need to do is get an anchor that can crush down to the bottom, and then the flukes or the, the, the uh, arms are long enough to dig down below the weeds and get into the seabed itself. As far as we're concerned, the only reliable anchor that does that is the fisherman anchor. And it also makes a great all-around storm anchor. So how do you know if it's weeds or leaves down there? Well, if the water's cloudy, you can't really see it. But if your anchor just seems to skip over the bottom, or if it catches and release, then chances are it's going to be one of the possibilities is that it's weeds. If you happen to be outfitted with one of these fishermen anchors, at least what we do is when it starts skipping or catching and releasing, we automatically switch to our fisherman anchor because we know that's set the first time every time. Another deception is leaves. Up in especially where the fresh water is, little rivers and creeks that are lined with trees, you have these trees that the leaves fall every year. They get waterlogged if they land in the creek. They sink to the bottom, and year after year, the leaves may pile up into sometimes quite a thick layer. And you're going to have the same problem. The anchor just won't set or it'll keep pulling out when you go to back down on it. Either case, switch to a fisherman anchor, and chances are your problems are solved. Another Rudy, problem that, yes. Rudy, you may be better without the headset because I think the audio is a little tough if you have the. All right, how's this folks? I think that's much better, thank you. Better, okay. Another seabed that you may run into is flat rock or coral, and it might be covered with a thin layer, a thin layer of soil. You run into this in the Keys, you run into this all over the Bahamas, and we've run into it uh, in, in some of the rivers also. The choice is there is you drill a hole and drop your anchor in it, or you carry one of those seven foot by seven foot by seven foot cement blocks and drop it overboard. The problem there is neither are very practical for a boat. Uh, one option that you have is in mild conditions, you can drop your anchor, back off 50 feet, and then dump 200 feet of chain in one spot. So now you have a, essentially a 200 pound block of chain sitting on the bottom. The problem here is as the wind rises, it starts pulling the chain out, and you'll eventually, if the wind gets high enough, start dragging. So if you're not sure where that point's going to uh, occur, you need to go somewhere else. Give me a second here to figure how to, to see, uh, get our um, question and answer up here. 
Uh, Rudy, the question is that um, I've heard that setting a stern anchor can sink your boat. When is it appropriate to use a stern anchor and when is it not? I heard the question. I'm still trying to get the... That's okay. I'll, I'll handle the, the, yeah. the box. Okay. If you, do you want uh, to answer that now or do you want to defer till the end? We'll partially answer it now. Okay. You should anchor by the bow. Bigger boats can get away with anchoring from the stern, but as the wind gets up and the waves become bigger, that becomes a dicey proposition. And the smaller the boat, the more likely you are to get pooped, water coming over the stern. Um, there is one technique you can use with an anchor off the stern, and we'll cover that towards the end of the presentation. But generally speaking, if you're laying to one anchor, you should always anchor off the bow. So how do you know if it's rock or limestone? Well, there again, your anchor is going to skip or it's going to catch and release. Um, there again, too, how do we di distinguish between vegetation and rock? It's very simple. We throw our fisherman anchor overboard. If it doesn't catch no matter what we do, then we just assume there's a layer of rock underneath that layer of sand. Now we'll talk about scope. This seems to be one of the most misunderstood aspects of anchoring. Scope is simply a ratio between the depth and the distance. And the way you determine scope is you first add together the depth of water. I'll do it this way. The depth of water, the height of the freeboard, any additional height of tide. Then you don't want to forget about how deep the anchor buried, excuse me, how high the storm surge will be, and how high any waves will be. These three are kind of difficult. But we give you uh, the guidelines I like to follow are in mud, in sand, the anchor might bury a foot, some more than that. But in mud, it can bury three, four, or five feet, and as the wind gets up, it can bury 10 or 12 or 15 feet. How do you know? You don't, but it's better to figure too much than too little. Storm surge, you figure three feet per. So gals and storms, the storm surge could be three feet. Category one, hurricane, another three feet. A category two, three more feet. A category three, three more feet. Category four, category five, three more feet for each of those. Could be more, might be less, but at least it gives you something to shoot for. I have to apologize. I can't bring the question and answer. Um, That's okay. Rudy, why don't I just tell you what the questions are and then we can take it from there. You don't have to bring it up. Okay, um, that's we, fine. Have, we have two questions. We have um, the first question that came in over chat was, uh, will you be covering uh, how to anchor in rock like in the Great Lakes? Um, and the second question is when anchoring in a narrow waterway, what's the best way to determine if we have enough swing room to anchor? Can we depend on current to keep the vessel centered in the narrow waterway or should we deploy a second anchor? Uh, good questions. Um, when you say rock, I interpret rock to mean just flat rock. Um, if it's a bunch of broken up rocks, I call that rocks. Um, and the technique used for rocks is the same as you would for sand or mud. You, you back up, you lower your anchor, you back up and you try and set it. Hopefully the, the anchor will either dig in between the rocks or encircle a rock that's big enough. Um, as with any time when you're anchoring, if, if you're expecting higher winds and you're uncomfortable with that situation, then uh, you just have to go someplace with a better seabed. Um, you may have an advantage by having a bigger anchor. 
uh, that, that provides more friction between the rocks or can encircle a larger rock. Uh, but there's some things, sometimes you, you just can't beat mother nature. You just have to do the best you can. And if that best isn't good enough, you have to go somewhere else. Uh, the other uh, question was, oh, the, the one anchor that does, well, in fact, the Bruce anchor, the claw anchor was designed for rocks. You know, it was designed to anchor these big oil rigs up in the North Sea, which the bottom was rocks. Uh, so a, a particular anchor design may be better suited for rocks than, than uh, another. Uh, Cecilia, what is the second part? Um, the second question is, when anchoring in a narrow waterway, what is the best way to determine if we have enough swing room to anchor? Can we depend on current to keep the vessel centered in the narrow waterway, or should we deploy a second anchor off the stern? We're going to cover multiple anchors, anchoring with multiple anchors, and this is one situation you may consider having more than one anchor. You can only de rely on the current keeping you centered, either upstream or downstream, if there's no wind. Once the wind starts picking up, the wind is going to skew your boat one way or another. And we did have one last question come in, and I don't know if you want to anchor, answer this now or if you're coming to it. Um, Salvatore wants us to please discuss anchoring in um, against wind versus tide or current when these elements are in opposition. Oh, when, when the wind and the current opposes each other. Um, or the tide, yeah. That's a fun time, uh, especially <laughs> when the wind and the current are have, have equal effects on your boat. Um, you'll find your, your road making a lot of noise on your boat. But when one overcomes the other, then that's going to dominate and your boat will lie mostly to that. Um, but when you've got them opposing, depending on the strength of either, um, it's an interesting time. Uh, and you'll just have to take each situation independently. But this is a time where more than one anchor may be of benefit. Now, if I don't answer your questions adequately, or if I don't quite understand it, uh, please, when we get to the last slide, write my phone number down and my email address and get in touch with me. I prefer phone calls because we can talk in more detail than uh, in emails. Once you've added up all six factors, we're talking about scope now, depth, freeboard, tide, depth of bury, height of the surge, height of the waves, you might add a little extra into that in case you might have underestimated one of these factors. Then you can multiply that answer by five if you have an all chain road, gives you five to one scope. Multiply it by seven if you part rope, part chain, gives you seven to one scope. Multiply it by 10 if you have an all rope road, and that gives you 10 to one scope. And that's simply how you calculate scope. But that's not all. Scopes, and this is what is misunderstood. Scopes of 5 to 1 and 7 to 1 are for mild weather only. The reason being, at 5 to 1, the anchor only has half the holding power as it has with 10 to 1. And here's why. In mild conditions, the road lays with a curve called a catenary. Eventually it lays on the bottom and it is attached to the anchor. Most of the time, you're not even pulling on the anchor, you're just being held by the friction of this rope or road laying on the bottom. But as the wind picks up, the boat starts getting pushed back, the road starts to straighten, the first thing you lose is the road that's laying on the bottom and that friction that holds the boat. At that point, the boat is totally, or the, uh, the holding is totally dependent on the angle that this road forms with the bottom. Now at five to one, that angle is 12, well, once this angle exceeds six degrees, which is 10 to one, a scope of 10 to one, 
you start losing holding power. And five to one, that angle is 12 degrees. And you lost half the holding power of the anchor. So as the wind starts picking up, you want to consider going to 10 to one. We find it's a lot simpler to gather in an extra 50, 25, 50, 75 feet of road the next morning after the bad weather's gone than it is to try and re-anchor the boat when we're dragging in the middle of the night when it's raining and the wind's blowing and all the boats around us uh, we're trying to avoid. Now we feel you might also want to consider anchoring to 10 to 1 when you're asleep, off the boat, or preoccupied. As long as your anchor is big enough and it's the right design for the bottom, then you have enough scope out that no matter what happens, chances are the boat's going to handle it on its own and doesn't need you there to help it. We have another question. Yes. Um, so this is from Ted. He sees commercial fishing boats using all cable road and drum windlass. Have we ever seen this on non-commercial boats? Yeah, these, the, these drums that sit on the deck and it's usually wound with uh, wire rope, maybe a little bit of chain on the end. Um, they also have models uh, for recreational boats. Uh, so if, if they're, uh, I think it's a, it's a good alternative to a boat that has a very poor arrangement with their anchor locker or their uh, windlass position where it just doesn't work well, then it's, this is a good option where you, you install one on your deck and you don't have to worry or deal with the difficulties of getting your scope or your road, whether it's rope or chain, down into an ill-conceived anchor locker. These, uh, they're not really windlasses, they're, they're more of a the term skips in mind right now, like you have on the front of a Jeep where it goes off-roading. Um, they can be electrical, you know, uh, electric motor run, they can be hydraulic. So anchor size, anchor design, and scope, they're involved every time you anchor. However, there are times where you may need to put out more than one anchor. And you only do this if it's necessary. Now this is where we're getting into a couple questions where anchoring off the stern and if you're in a narrow body of water and you don't have room to swing. So you put out a second or third anchor to avoid fouling an anchor, to avoid hitting or being hit or grounding your boat to avoid tripping, bending, or breaking an anchor, or to lay better to the wind or seas. However, an anchor's an anchor, and if you've got an anchor in the water, it has to be big enough, it has to be of a design that's uh, compatible with the bottom, and it has to have adequate scope. And two smaller anchors do not equal one big anchor. Now the way you can lay out these, these anchors, one way is V pattern. Off the bow of your boat, you lay your anchors out in a V shape. Another arrangement is bow and stern. You have one anchor tied to the bow, you have another anchor tied to the stern. With this arrangement, if the wind comes on your beam, it'll increase the load on your anchors by 50%. Another range, I have to apologize because our uh, split screen here is kind of covering up part of my uh, diagrams. The other anchor, again, these anchors are laid off 180 degrees, but they're both tied to the bow. Whereas here, they're tied bow and stern. 
Then another choice is you put out two or three or four anchors in circular pattern. This, this technique here, bow and stern, I don't think really applies to the question what he was asking if he can anchor off the stern. Um, but this is the um, case where one anchor is attached to the stern. To eliminate this anchor and anchor just from the stern, it's not really designed to handle the conditions coming onto them from the stern. In fact, you'll have more of a load on your ground tackle because most of the time the windage and the uh, frontal area to the waves are, are greater than if it was bow in. The exception to that would be like a, I hate to say a double ender because all boats have two ends, but a double ender where it presents about as much uh, area to the waves as it would if it was anchored to the front. Another technique is called a hammerlock moor. If you got a boat that's constantly ro roaming around, I'll do it this way. Um, you can lay out one anchor like you should, and then another anchor you just drop down at the, at the foot of the stem maybe a little slack so when the boat swings one way, this anchor will tend to minimize how far it swings and then the other way also. We have another question. I guess the question is whether you could please describe the process for deploying the second anchor. Should one use a dinghy? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. We get it all the time. Any way you can is the answer. Now, you can use, let me see if we can get a picture here. All right, Let, let's uh, use this picture. Well, here, here, the easiest way is you come up here, you drop your anchor, you back down twice the distance of the scope you want, drop this anchor, and then you come forward, center the boat and secure your roads. Or, you drop this anchor, come up this way twice as far, drop this anchor and then center the boat. A lot of it depends on current and wind conditions. What's gonna be simpler? Yes. Okay, so we have, uh, should you wait for the anchor? There's two questions here. Should we wait for the anchor to rest on the bottom before letting out road? Um, it's dark and you can't see footage marks. Can you estimate road by counting? And the second is to comment on the value of multiple anchors versus an unretrievable tangled mess. Hmm. Yes, I'm trying to sort out that second question. Uh, the, first, <laughs> the first question is what? The first question is, should you wait for the anchor to rest on the bottom before letting out road? It's dark and you can't see footage marks. Can you estimate road by counting? Okay. Well, if we're talking about this particular fore and aft, you can set this anchor or whichever anchor you set first, you, you set just like you would ordinarily. You come up here, you set this anchor, you back down. This one, you drop and come back up. And maybe you can set it with the boat. Maybe you can set it by pulling in tight on, on your road. Um, how much do you know? One of the requirements, first of all, your road has to be marked so you know how much is out. We strongly encourage people to mark the roads in ways that you can see it in low light conditions. In our case, we, we if you go to our website, we'll give you the the address in the last slide, we have examples of how we suggest you mark your road. And we favor these marks because first, they can be easily seen. Second, they can be felt when they go through your hands. And we too anchor a lot in dark, low light visible, uh, conditions. And it's not uncommon for us to run our hand, or run the road through our hands and we can count these marks as they go through our hands. We know exactly how much road is out. Um, 
Another way to get a second anchor out, you come up here, you lay out this anchor, any of these patterns. You lay this out, you come back, you establish yourself. Now you can use a dinghy. You don't have to use the main uh, mothership to get your second anchor out, whether it's behind you or off to the side. Um, you can use one dinghy. You can use two dinghies in tandem. One uh, dinghy handles the ground tackle. The other dinghy is the one that provides the, the um, engine power. Uh, if you're using one dinghy, the question, you'll, you'll, you'll hear this argument about put all the road in the dinghy and, and drag it out as out of the dinghy as you go out, or do you drag the road off the boat as you go out? Again, it depends on the wind and the current. Um, if, you, if you're anchored, let's say the wind and the current is coming this way, there's no reason you can't put all the road in the or leave the road on the boat, put the anchor in the dinghy, because the wind and current is going to help you pull that out. If the wind and current is going this way, you may want to put all the road in the dinghy, motor the dinghy out with the road um, being pulled off the dinghy and, and drop your anchor. Um, whew, let's see. We've been in conditions that are so severe that we can't. We don't dare even try to get the dinghy out. Uh, so we swim the anchors out. Uh, we, we attach enough flotation to the anchor so that it hangs a few inches off the bottom. And then flotation periodically along, uh, into, uh, along the road enough so that the big loops don't drag on the bottom. Get in, Jill gets in her mass snorkel and fins. If the water's cold, she'll even put a wetsuit on. <laughs> And then she'll swim the anchor out to where we want, release the slip knots on the flotation, and the anchor drops down, uh, and then we uh, pull in the slack on the, on the mothership. I don't really care how you do it. It doesn't matter. The job is to get the anchor out in the same way as possible. Uh, I hope that answered the question. I think that was a second part to that. There's another question. Um, actually, one has since come in as well. Um, the question was, if you could comment on the value of multiple anchors versus having them all be tangled up and, and having an unretrievable tangled mess. Um, and then another question came in. We got one over the chat, which uh, asks, should all anchors have a, uh, a marker buoy? And I guess if the answer is no, then when, when, when is it appropriate to use a marker buoy? Let's go back to the first question, but I forget it. Um, this is the, this is, is please comment, uh, please comment on the value of having multiple anchors versus the risk of an unretrievable tangled mess. Well, if your boat's going to run into a problem, if you don't put a second anchor out, then it's more important to get two anchors out. And then, and if you do it right, they shouldn't tangle. Um, we're, we've got another slide here we want to go to, but if you're at risk of following your anchor or another anchor, then you need to put another anchor out to keep the boat or road away from that anchor. If you're going to get hit or you're going to hit another boat because you're too close to them, or you're going to run into shoal water or ground in some way, you need to get a second anchor out so when the wind or current shifts, you don't, that doesn't happen. If you've got an anchor that uh, uh, is going to trip when the current changes or the wind changes and you sideload that anchor, you need to put another anchor out so when the boat shifts around and the wind or, or current change, it pulls on the second anchor, not on the first anchor. And it's the same with if you've got an anchor that is big enough but it might bend or break if you sideload it. You have to get another anchor out that's going to take a load off that first anchor when the wind or current shifts. And there's a second question there. And I, it has it was to be related to, uh, related to when to use a buoy for the anchors. Okay, well, hold on. Okay. Um, we never use a, well, there's, when you're, you're talking about a buoy, there's two different situations. Are you, 
but you can use a buoy to mark where your anchor is. And if that's the case, um, you don't have to be too concerned about how hefty of a pendant you have on that buoy. If you're marking using that, that float because you want to be able to recover a uh, stuck anchor, um, that anchor might be stuck so, so strongly that it can take thousands of pounds to get that anchor back unstuck up out of the bottom. Uh, so in that case, you need to have a fairly hefty line on it. And we think half inch line is probably the smallest you want to use if you're going to put any type of a strain on that line to recover your anchor. If, on the other hand, these marker boys can also interfere with your anchor. I mean, if the wind and currents shift and you override your, your buoy line, your, your pendant, and it gets fouled up in your, your uh, road, uh, that's going to change the whole dynamics of your anchor ability to hold. And if the wind picks up, uh, your anchor may pull out because it's all tangled in your, in your marker buoy. I don't believe you should have one unless you absolutely need it. Um, you don't really need to mark where your anchor is. I mean, anybody comes in can watch the angle of the road and they know about where your anchor is. And if they don't, you can go over and tell them. Uh, if you're concerned that the anchor is going to get fouled on the bottom, that's a different story. And you may, may want to use a, a uh, retrieval buoy. Another, uh, the, the, the big problem, wait, I think we have a, another question there. Cecilia? Uh, yep, there is a new question. What, uh, what about using two anchors on one road? Two anchors, well, it's not really on one road. It's two anchors on with secondary roads that are attached to the primary road. And uh, it's called a tandem anchoring arrangement. The Navy has, has studied this and they've determined that with tandem anchoring, they can increase the holding power by 30% in a mud bottom and a little less in sand. The problem is if you don't do that, or if you do it incorrectly, uh, you've made the situation worse, not better. I don't have diagrams of that. It's in, it, we talk about it and have diagrams in our book. Uh, but the most important thing is, and we see this a lot, is that the anchors are attached to each other incorrectly and it allows one or both of them to trip. So if you're going to use tandem anchors, I encourage you to beg, borrow, um, well, I was going to say steal, but no. Uh, buy, beg, or borrow our book and go to the section on tandem anchors and read about how to do it and what not to do. It's very important you don't attach them so that the anchor, one anchor will trip the other one. So in any of these arrangements with more than one anchor, this can be the result. Now, you can detach each road, untangle them and reattach the road, or you can use a ring attached to a swivel. In other words, each, each anchor is attached to the swivel and a separate shackle, in, I'm sorry, each anchor is attached to the, the ring, and then a swivel is attached to the ring, which is attached to pendant, which comes up to the boat. In theory, this is supposed to allow the boat to go in circles, and the swivel will keep things from becoming tangled like you saw in the previous picture. Some important aspects of this though is first of all this ring has to be big enough that the shackles do not jam against each other. So when you go to buy your ring or you go to your water machine shop and make up the ring, take all, all the shackles with you so you can establish how big of a ring you need. 
the shackles, all these shackles, has to have a workload limit that equals or exceeds the load on your ground tackle. If you have a G3 chain, roof coil, or BBB chain, the same, typical shackles you buy in a store or chandlery are carbon shackles, and they work. They're designed to fit and match workload limits with a G3 chain. If you have G4 chain, you need to get alloy shackles. They're the only ones that are designed to fit in equal in strength G4 chain. The swivel, it too needs to have a workload limit that equals or exceeds the load. We favor eye-to-eye -eye, eye -eye swivels because this one's attached with the shackle which provides universal movement. This one can be attached to the shackle or even if it's just spliced to the road, um, it still has a universal movement. And when you have universal movement at both ends, it's almost impossible to jam that swivel inside the road because if you side load it, it's going to break up to 50 of its rated workload limit. The pendant that comes up to your boat does come with workload limits. They only tell you the pendant. So the size, the way you size rope in your ground tackle is you pick a rope that has a tensile strength eight times the load. So if you're going to have a load of 5,000 pounds on your ground tackle, you need to have rope with a tensile strength of 16,000 pounds. And the way you do that is you go to the manufacturer's chart, you find 16,000 pounds, you go over, it'll tell you what size rope you do. But the big question is where do you find what kind of load you can expect on your ground tackle? Oh, there we go, it's hidden. And what you do is you go to a load chart. Can is this chart kind of covered up with a near screen, Cecilia? Um, well, every individual user can move their video portion around, so everybody. Okay, can, yes. so if you can move it, fine. But what you're going to see here is a load table that we have in our website, trawlertrainingabc.com. It's in our book. And you can find it in several other books and maybe and I believe even online if you look hard enough for it. It tells you size boats, tells you the wind speeds, and it tells you the load on the ground tackle. So if we take oh my God, sorry, I can't see. Let me get my book out here. So if we take a soap table. Um, some people are having some uh, intermittent issues with your audio. I think it might be just a connection issue. So everyone just uh, be patient. It seems to work itself out in cycles. Okay. So if you take that load table and you have a 40 foot sailboat and 30 knot winds, you're going to have 1200 pounds on your ground tackle. If you have that same 40 foot sailboat and 60 knot winds, you're going to have 4,800 pounds. So you use this chart this table to determine your workload, then you go over and you size your ring, your shackles, your swivels, and your rope based on that workload. Now, it's not uncommon to find people that give these rules of thumb. They say, oh, I didn't have to do any of that. In modern if you're in Anchorage with moderate protection from seas, excuse me, wind produces half of the load on the ground tackle and seas the other half. So if you find somebody that's um, arguing with you, you have to stop and ask or, or think. Maybe they had a different style or a different size anchor. Maybe they anchored in a different type bottom. You might have been in mud, they might have been in sand. Maybe they had much better protection uh, from the seas than you did. So they didn't have quite the load on the ground tackle that you might have had. Uh, they may have a boat with less windage. And they may have 
less wind on their boat than you did. They might have been anchored back in this little cove, surrounded with trees and condos and bluffs, and you were out in the middle of Chesapeake Bay. So just because they got away with a smaller anchor or with less scope doesn't mean you will, unless you're in the identical same conditions they were in. So we're getting towards the end. If you have a question or you want us to present a PowerPoint presentation to your club, give us a call. My email address. If you go to our if you go to our uh, website, trawlertrainingabc.com, you'll see several pages there where we'll give you more tips and tricks. Uh, but the best thing to do is buy the book, read it, understand it, and call for questions or to get a better understanding. But please, we don't text. More questions. I believe we have another 10 minutes so we can sit here and answer questions. Okay, great. So first question. Uh, is there any special consideration when using a power windlass? Proper procedure to deploy and retrieve with a power windlass? Well, on any windlass, you don't use the windlass to bring the boat up to the anchor. Uh, the workload limits on most windlasses are much lower than the power, than the load that you can put on them if you try and, especially as the conditions get more harsh. If you have an electric windlass, you always keep the circuit breaker off unless you're using the windlass. Another thing is you don't set the anchor or break the anchor out or lay to the anchor with your uh, road, at, uh, the strain on your windlass. Um, you don't wanna break your windlass. So when you're setting or breaking out your anchor, you can use a chain stopper or a soft stopper. Um, this is, this all goes into uh, another presentation we have, but it's a great question. Once you do anchor, like we said in the beginning of this presentation, you attach a snubber or a bridle, take the load off, uh, off your windlass. Many of these electric windlasses have been known to activate on their own because they short out in some way, and then your anchor either goes up or goes down and it's, it's problematic. So when you're done using your windlass, shut the electric, uh, the circuit breaker off. Okay, um, the next question, what is the best way to determine the proper length and diameter for an anchor bridle slash snubber? As an example, would 30 feet of three quarter inch eight braid nylon be appropriate for a 32,000 pound 50 foot sailboat deploying a three eighth inch all chain road? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but here the answer is yes. <laughs> answer is yes, but up to what wind speed? Okay, your snubber is just like a rope road. You want it to have at least eight times uh, the tensile strength than than what's needed. Uh, so if you're anchored in ten knots of wind, yeah, three quarter, seven eighths is plenty big enough. If you're in 110 knot winds, uh, it's not going to be adequate. Uh, you should have, well, it's not going to conform to that requirement of having a tensile strength eight times the load on your boat. Uh, so the question, just about every question when it comes to your gear is, my first response is, what wind speed? Because what works in mild conditions won't work in necessarily when the conditions get worse. The good news is if you size everything for bad conditions, harsh conditions, it will work when the conditions are mild. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, recent debate on swivels. Oh, wait, wait. Of... Uh, I'm oh, sorry, oh, let, yes. let me interrupt you. That's Snubbers fine. need, uh, again, the harder, no matter what rope you have, whether it's a road or a snubber or a bridle, the higher the wind speeds, the it, it, your rope really needs, your, your, your rope road, your snubber and your bridle needs to conform to three requirements. It has to have a tensile strength at least eight times the load, the, the highest load. It needs to have at least uh, say 8%, 9% stretch at 15% loading. 
and that essentially means it has to be three strand, eight plate or 12 grade nylon. And it has to be of long length because it's the length that cushions the, the surge loads. As an example, a rope that'll stretch 10% and is 10 foot long will only stretch one foot. But that same rope, 40 feet long, will stretch four feet. And it provides a huge amount of difference in the ability to cushion surge loads. So your road, your snubber, and your bridle should all be done. So in mild conditions, your snubber only or bridle only has to be a few feet long. But as the wind picks up, they need to get longer and longer and longer. And we recommend at least 30 feet for gale force conditions and 40 feet for storm force conditions. So as far as the diameter goes, that depends on your wind speed, which establishes the load. The load establishes the tensile strength. Okay, go ahead. Okay, next question. Uh, recent debate on swivels warns of side loads. One proposed solution is to have a short section of chain from the anchor ring to the swivel. Do you have any thoughts on this? Sure, that's excellent. The more the more you can reduce the opportunity for a swivel to get bound up and develop a side load, the better off it is. We believe that the swivel, if there's any chance at all, since it can break at half the load of what it's rated, if you're concerned that your swivel is going to be bound, bound up and develop a side load, you should have a swivel that has a working load limit 150% of the load. Um, now, if you can, if you can introduce universal movement at both ends of that swivel, it it decreases its opportunity for getting bound up in a side load developing. And if you put at least one link in a chain, and this is more than adequate, I think. But the more links of chain you put in here, the less likely the swivel will be able to get locked in position and side load develop. The problem is all swivels, I don't care who makes them or what they're made out of, can encounter conditions that uh, binds them up. Uh, I don't care how many links of chain you have in here. If this swivel lays over the edge of a, an engine block sitting on the bottom, then it's going to get locked in place and a side load can develop. So increasing this distance here does not guarantee it can't get side loaded, it just improves it. If you have a boat with so little distance between the bow roller and the windlass, you may not be able to put uh, a length of chain in here. You may have to set, uh, settle for just the shackle, but that shackle is more than adequate. Okay, um, so I know uh, the, the webinar is free to run over for anybody who wants to. I do have one question I want to ask Rudy that came in before the webinar started, so I want to address that, that one particular question. Um, we will continue for anyone who wants to stick around uh, and see the rest. Of, we have a lot of questions in the list here for as long as Rudy is available. Uh, we'll try to answer those, or you can reach out to him after the fact. And uh, thank you again for joining. Before we end, in a couple of minutes, though, Rudy, somebody did send in a question prior to the Webinar, webinar starting about any special considerations for anchoring for rafting up as a group of boats. If you could address that and then as time allows, we'll, we'll get to these others. Okay, great question. Uh, when you're rafting, the first, per, the first boat in sets his anchor out like he should. Um, and then depending on how many boats raft to them, the, the boats on the ends set out their anchors and if it's a big raft, you usually every second or third boat sets out their anchors also. Uh, if boats have things that stick up in the air and may catch on each other like outriggers or um, spreaders on sailboats, uh, they usually recommend that you raft head to toe to offset these accoutrements. Uh, I don't care how many anchors are out. My opinion is when the wind picks up, you break up the uh, raft and you go anchor on your own. 
it's easier to do that when the wind's mild than it is when it's blowing 30 or 40 knots. Less damage is done also. Great, do you have time to hang on for a few more? Yeah, sure. Great, uh, okay. I'm not a big favor of rafting unless it's real mild conditions. You never know the quality uh, of the gear your neighbor's using. You never know what its um, limits are. And a lot of times you don't even know the conditions, the, the, the uh, circumstances of the upcoming conditions. It's not uncommon at all, at least in where I'm from, Florida and the Bahamas, that in summertime you could have a perfectly nice balmy day and then in five, 10 minutes later, it's blowing 40 or 50 knots and raining quite heavily with these little squalls that come through. Or worse, at night when these thunderless storms come through and you can't even see them coming. Back, back to road markers, we feel you only need to mark your road every 25 feet. We talked about, you know, go, go to our website, trawlertrainingabc.com, go to the page that says road markers and you'll see the road markers that we recommend. It's also in the book if you have the book. Um, but we really believe in not only should you be able to see them as easily as possible, you should be able to feel them if you have to, but it helps also if they're long lasting. Any so Rudy, uh, oh yeah, there's a few questions here. Um, okay. So someone who's someone who's space challenged. If you had to choose two types somebody of anchors, who? somebody who has limited space aboard their boat, if you had to choose only two anchors, which two anchors would you choose? Two big fisherman anchors. The fisherman anchor, for those who don't know, is like this one here. You know, when you go out and get your tattoo on your shoulder, you know, you usually get one like this. Um, that's the only anchor that works in more bottoms than any other anchor because it'll work in sand, mud, rocks, weeds. Um, and if you don't know where you're gonna, what you're going to be anchoring in, uh, you might as well get an anchor that does that. Unfortunately, that anchor is, it requires some forethought in preparation to be able to get it off overboard and back on board. Um, otherwise, any of the newer generation anchors we're in favor of. Uh, we, on our boat, and for 20 years, we've used a Supermax anchor. We are very, we like that a lot, obviously, or we wouldn't use it. It looks like this. Um, but any of the newer generation anchors, whether it's a roll bar or not a roll bar, they work well. For a second anchor, you can get one of these, say fortress anchors, you can get a quite large one, great holding power, and it's a lot lighter than a steel anchor. Uh, the problem with these pivoting fluke anchors, like the fortress and the Danforth, is they make a great bow anchor, but if the if you're anchored in the deeper in the bottom it buries, the less likely it is to trip out when the boat uh, swings either to the current or the wind. And the shallower it is that it sets, the more likely it will trip out and then you'll drag. So if you're using one of these pivoting fluke anchors, whether it's a Danforth or Fortress or one of the other makes, uh, if you're expecting a wind or current shift, you need to set out a second anchor so when this boat shifts, it starts pulling on the, the second anchor and not side loading and tripping. Oh, what's going on here? Uh, not side loading or, or tripping um, the, the primary anchor. We cruise for 20 years, 20 some years, well, 15 years with, uh, we have a 34 foot boat, a 55 pound super max anchor and a 70 pound fisherman anchor. And that's all we had for 15 years. We got a little extra money in year 15 or 16. And that's when we 
put on a, a, a fortress anchor uh, only because <laughs> only only because uh, we wanted the convenience of the lightweight. We used it either as a second anchor or to catch off. You know, we've been known to occasionally run aground. Um, then when we had a little more money, we bought a little smaller fortress anchor because it was a little more convenient to use than the big one, or it'll double as a, a dinghy anchor if we really need, needed a bigger anchor. So that's pretty much our complement of anchors. We have a 55 pound super max, and that's been instrumental in holding us in a category three hurricane. Uh, we have our seven, oh, we also added eventually we found a good price on a 100 pound fisherman anchor that's down in the bilge in case we ever need it. The advantage to two anchors is not only can it help you stay in place, but if you should have to slip your anchor or you lose an anchor, you have an, a second anchor to use uh, in, in the meantime of either recovering the first anchor or going out and buying a second anchor. Okay, I'm just going to go down in the order that these questions were received until, I mean, we have uh, still about 60 people on the line here, so as long as you're willing. Yeah, go um, Okay, uh, what's the purpose of turning off the circuit breaker on the windlass? You mentioned that earlier. Why, why is it someone should do that? If your electric windlass should short out, and they do do that, when it shorts, if it shorts dead, nothing happens. But if it shorts active, then your anchor is either going to come in or it's going to go out. Either way, it's going to be problematic. So to avoid that, you shut the circuit breaker off to, to cut all power to your windlass unless you're going to use it. Unfortunately, in many of the deliveries we've done, the circuit breakers are positioned in very awkward to get to locations. And it's just the opposite. They should be where they're readily and easily uh, gotten to. So if you've got a circuit breaker and it's difficult to get to it, you may want to consider relocating it. It's going to take some effort, some, some wiring and some time and some money, but at least you're going to be, you, you'll, you'll have it in a place where you can shut it off when you need to shut it off. Go ahead. Okay. Great. We had about three questions around snubbers. Um, can you comment on snubbers? Can you explain what snubbers are, what they do? Yes. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture here. But once you get your anchor out set and you've established adequate scope, you attach some sort of a elastic rope line of some sort to your road and uh, one end attaches to your road, the other end attaches to your boat, and then you put slack in your road so there's no load on the, the windlass, and the snubber takes off the shock loads. Um, it takes the load off the windlass, and for rope roads, we encourage you to use a snubber or bridle on rope roads also because uh, once you slack off your road, any chafe that might occur occurs on the snubber and not on your rope road. So even if it parts, your boat is still held by the, the uh, anchor. Great. Um, so this next one is of interest to me too. I have the same problem. Um, my G4 chain always cones in the locker. I'm thinking of fabricating an angled chute to direct the chain to the side. Do you think that will work or will it just move the cone? Um, okay. Uh, a lot of it depends on the shape of the, I'm not sure I heard the question, but I'm going to answer what I think I heard. A lot of it depends on the shape of your anchor locker. If you've got a well-designed anchor, or a well-designed and well-positioned anchor locker and a well-positioned windlass, you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, you shouldn't, the chain should go in and out um, on its own without needing any assistance. Once in a while, uh, when the chain is to all in, in, the, in the locker, it may tip over and you may need to give the chain a yank when you're deploying your anchor to, to pull it out from under the, the pile. Uh, if, you, if you need to, I think you said a cone? Yeah, it cones when it's loading. 
builds up into a cone. Well, yeah. Um, okay. Give me the question again. Um, so the, the question is that the G4 chain always makes a cone yep. in the locker when it's being brought in. So he, he's thinking of fabricating an angled shoot so that he can direct the chain off to the side. Do you think that will resolve the coning issue or is it just going to move the cone to another location in the locker? I think that's all it's going to do. It's going to pile the chain up somewhere else. Um, I Again, we don't use anything and our chain drops directly into the the chain locker. Um, we don't use anything. It, it just about always comes back out without a problem. The only time it might it, it be a problem is if somehow that cone gets so tall that it kind of tips over and traps the, the, the chain. And all we do is then we just, at the windlass, we just yank it out, pull up on it. One thing we do to minimize the height of that um, cone is the first 100 feet we'll go after we get about the first 100 feet in we'll go down and we'll spread the pile out and then 50 feet later we'll spread that pile out uh, but we can usually put in 75 to 100 feet of chain and even if it doesn't pile up that high and if it does it doesn't usually tip over um, if, if you've been in rough seas you may want to go down and uh, you may want to be prepared to have to yank the chain out once if it if the cone is tipped over and the chain gets caught you may have to pull up on it but we've never had to go down into the chain locker and and uh, and try to re resolve the issue are always able to pull up on. Sometimes it takes a harder pull than others. Some people will put some sort of a appliance in their chain locker, like say one of these uh, traffic cones, um, although it'll collapse. So what they do is they fill it with foam or something to keep it from collapsing with the idea that it'll, uh, as the chain comes in, it'll kind of spread out where it goes. Uh, and if you're having a problem with your chain getting trapped underneath itself in your chain lock, you may want to think about something like that. But just to divert it to, a, to another position, it's not, I don't think it's going to save the, solve the problem. Okay. Next. Next. Um, if I need to bend on road, what is the best knot to use to retain as much strength as possible? I heard the best knot if you're going to what with your road? Uh, if he if he needs to bend on his road, I'm assuming. You mean tie, say tie a snubber to the road? Yeah, if he needs to use a knot to retain, what's the best knot to use on your road to retain as much strength as possible? We strongly favor uh, the rolling hitch. Um, again, you can go to our website and see this hitch. Um, it's it's not that you need a knot that's strong. What you need is rope that's strong enough to begin with, because then any loss that the, the knot contributes uh, to the strength is overcome by having the rope that's too strong to begin with. And that's one of the reasons you size your rope to have a tensile strength eight times uh, the load that's expected to be on it, because then you have plenty of excess strength and any loss of knot uh, that, that occurs because of the knots uh, kind of a moot point. But we favor a rolling hitch or one of its variants. Um, if the rope is too big for the rolling hitch to tighten down on, on the road, um, then we favor putting in a snubber braid on the end and that's almost guaranteed to never slip. That too, I believe is on the same page on our website that the rolling hitch is on. Um, so consider a rolling hitch, one of its variants, a camel hitch is one. You know, if you change number of twists or the direction that the, you, you lay the, the knot in, then you just call it a different name. But the rolling hitch, the camel hitch, um, consider putting a snubber braid if it still slips. 
another thing uh, that we we find, you know, I don't understand why people don't do this that are, uh, the correct term is bending on the snubber to the, to the road. But if you're tying your snubber on is when you're bringing your road in, bring the snubber knot right up over the roller with it, and then you can untie it right there on deck. You don't have to lean over uh, the bow roller or the, the uh, bow railing. And then you leave it there. Uh, when you go to use it, you tie it on and let it go back out with the road. You don't have to, again, lay over the, the bow roller or the bow railing to tie it on. If you're using uh, one of these metal hooks, uh, it doesn't always work that way. But with the snubber braid, as long as your roller is three or four inches wide, you shouldn't have a problem doing that. Uh, next up, I just ordered a Mantis uh, stainless steel swivel. Are there any problems with the stainless steel to galvanized connection? No. But I don't care what the promotion says, that swivel can still, if it gets bound, can still be side loaded. So you have to understand what its workload limit is in straight line pull and then you'll understand that if it does get jammed up and side loaded, it can break with 50% less load. So if you're gonna size it, um, well, you've already bought it. So it's not that you can't use it, it's you need to know what its limits are, what wind speed. So you go to your load table again and establish, once you know where the weakness is in that swivel, you know at what maximum wind speed based on your boat size that you should rely on it. When speeds get higher, the load gets higher, then you take the swivel out. Unless you wanna risk something unfortunate happening. Next. Okay, next. Uh, is an ultra anchor considered a modern design? Yes, it is. It's a very good anchor. Okay. Uh, next one, this goes back to the uh, to the tidal or maybe even a river current at times. Uh, and we have the same issue. It's interesting to me, uh, Rudy, being on a full keel vessel uh, where the where the current awfully uh, oftentimes has more control than the wind. Um, how do you anchor when you know the current is going to switch 180 degrees at 3 a.m.? Um. Well, if your anchor's not at risk of tripping out and you have the space, the swing room, don't do anything. If you're concerned that it, it might trip or bend or you don't have the swing room, then you have to get a second anchor out, preferably before it happens. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, here's another one. Uh, with an electric windlass, any difference in letting the anchor free fall manually rather than power the road out? I favor free fall because you're saving a lot of work on the on the motor. So you just, uh, this brings up a, a thought also is every windlass, electric or manual, needs to be taken apart periodically in service so that you, in this case, when, when you loosen the brake, it does free fall. Um, so it usually means take the components apart, clean them, grease them, put them back together again. Um, but yeah, go. No, there's nothing wrong with free falling. Okay. Um, next question. Can you tell us your opinion of the claw style anchor? The claw, like a Bruce? The claw style? That's all, it, that's all I got, claw style. Let me see if it's coming up in the chat if whoever posted it. C-L-A-W? Yeah, well, no, there's nothing wrong with them. The problem I find with them, and we mentioned this in the very first slide, is uh, the people have problems with them and almost inevitably is their anchor's too small. The, at least when Bruce was manufacturing them, when the Bruce anchor was being manufactured, they claim that the anchor was good up to gale force winds, 45 knots. But I just don't find that to be 
applicable in sand or in mud. Um, and that's why we say if you have a, a claw or the older generation of like a delta or a plow, it has to be even bigger than you would have if you had one of the newer generations. The good anchors, the great anchors, it just needs to be bigger than you might otherwise buy if you bought a newer generation. Or you don't use it beyond the point where it starts becoming unreliable. Next. Okay, next. Uh, so this one comes from Barry. Uh, and Barry, I just sent you a text also from Ed Kelly, who's on the line and answered some of this as well. It kind of goes back to the current situation. And, um, and maybe, Rudy, this could be an answer of what's the best anchor that will reset for me under these circumstances. But Barry's asking, if I anchor in a river while the tide is coming in, do I have to reset my anchor when the tide is going out? Only if you're uncomfortable that it will stay set. Most anchors today, especially the newer generation anchors, uh, can handle shifts like that. The one anchor you definitely have to be careful with are the pivoting fluke anchors, like the Fortress and the Danforth. Because once, when, when your boat swings and it side loads that anchor, it tends to trip over. If it's buried, Deeply in mud, um, Fortress has literature that shows that it doesn't trip out. But if if you're in sand or shallow, or if you're buried shallow in, in mud, uh, you definitely have to be concerned that that anchor will trip and you'll drag. Mostly because uh, it'll get clogged and won't re won't the the, the flukes won't fall back into position like they should. Or once you start dragging, your boat's moving so fast it can't set itself. So anytime you're concerned uh, that your anchor might trip or drag, you get a second anchor out in the direction that you think is best suited to handle the shift in wind or current. It's so much easier to retrieve two anchors the next morning than it is to try and deal with dragging at three in the morning when it's raining and blowing hard. We never begrudge ourselves. I mean, we always, whenever we're, we've, our anchor is, well, I'm not even gonna say it. Um, whenever we are in a situation where we're a little bit concerned, uh, we'll prep our, 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 our fisherman anchor. And if we're really concerned, we'll even get it out. Now we may get it out with a lot of slack on the road, uh, but the few minutes that it takes to go from on deck to in the bottom may make all the difference as to whether we hit another boat or drag into shoals. So it all depends on the circumstances, whether we prep it and have it ready to go overboard, or if we get it overboard and just leave it, say, close to the boat, or we take it out and set it like we would if it was a main bower with with full amount of scope. Anchoring is not a speed sport. It's not for the lazy. You've got, see, it, it, it doesn't, it, it's not up to you. It's up to what mother nature requires. And any decision you make should be made in such a way that you're gonna outperform mother nature, no matter what it takes. Go ahead. Okay, next. Uh, when calculating ground tackle load capacity, I would imagine one should take into account the load capacity of a bridle setup. Um, is it possible to build a bridle that can meet a 5,000 pound working load requirement? To build a bridle, yes, to build a bridle that can meet a 5,000 pound working requirement. Yes. The bridle has to be, well, theoretically, should be sized to handle the the the, um, the rope that is used should be sized to handle eight times the maximum load. So if if you're looking for a 5,000 pound load, you need rope that's going to be a 40,000 pound tensile strength. Now, that's pretty big rope. <laughs> Uh, so you don't necessarily have to have one snubber or one bridle 
to handle, to use all the time. You can have, uh, say, a bridle that'll handle a thousand pound load that is more, that is used typically daily. And then save the 5,000 pound load bridle for when conditions are going to turn harsh. The key there is switch it out before you need it, not after you should have. Okay, go ahead. Okay, next uh, from Mark. <clears throat> Pardon me. Most windlasses have one gypsy and one drum. Even if the secondary anchor is mostly rope, how would you suggest retrieving the remaining 25 plus feet of chain that would normally be attached to a mixed rope slash chain road? Yeah. Chain can go around that uh, warping drum. It makes, it's noisy. It'll scratch it up, but you can still retrieve it. And it doesn't, it takes a little more work than rope would. Uh, but my question is, why do you have chain on your second road? Uh, the only time you need chain is if you're on a second road is if you're concerned with chafe. And there's a lot of different anti-chafe techniques you can use to minimize or eliminate chafe on the rope road. So we never use chain on our second road when we're putting a second anchor out, unless I'm concerned that while well, there's two situations, we may use a length of chain if we're concerned about chain, say, on the bottom, rub, the road rubbing on the bottom. Or if we want to get some weight somewhere, uh, we, we may put like a 20 or 30 foot section of chain halfway down the road and just tie it on uh, as a kellet to keep that road low to the bottom or, or down low say if we're in an area where we get a lot of outboards running through and we're concerned to chain somebody may run over a road uh, so we'll put a weight on that rope to sink it down and keep it out of the way of most propellers uh, but usually we don't use chain uh, and, and again the only time we would recommend you do use chain is if you're concerned about chain um, I hope that answered it. So okay. yes, okay. So yeah, I just just if you got a, a mixed road, part rope, part chain, just bring it in on the warping drum. And I think after you've done that a few times, you'll take the chain off. <laughs> we have two two final questions. Uh, one is, if uh, money wouldn't be an issue, which of the new generation anchors would you buy? They're all good. I use, a, like you see here, the Supermax Anchor. Um, so naturally, that's the one I would encourage people to buy. But they're all, whether it's a Rockna, an Ultra, um, a Mantis, any of those are going to be more than adequate for you. None of them work in weeds. That's the one point I need to make is if you're in weeds you and you want to have a reliable anchor, you really need to outfit with a, a, a fisherman anchor. Next. Okay, next. And, and we had one more pop in. So the next question is from Mark. If you could just reiterate your phone number. Oh, sure. <laughs> we'll put it on each slide. I typed it in from what I have. What I have your book, and it's in here. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's the phone same. number eight five zero eight three two seven seven four eight. My email address is Rudy Sachet at gmail dot com, and our website is trawlertrainingabc dot com. So between the three of them, you should be able to get hold of me somehow. <laughs> we don't text, though. We do no not texting. Text. Phone, email, or website. Um, and we have one last question here uh, from Salvatore. Your opinion on anchor anvils that slide down road for added weight?
I believe you're talking. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of the. I, I didn't quite catch the word you used. Uh, anvils, anchor anvils. Uh, anvils. A N. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're known by a lot of different terms. Angels, sentinels, uh, riding weights. Um, yeah. If you need to get more of a catenary in your road, or you need to get the road down lower from the surface, yeah, they're fine. Uh, it's one more step. Uh, I. I don't recommend you use it unless you have a specific reason for using it, but there's no harm in using it. Um, I want to go back here because this is a very important point to scope. And this is the part that's misunderstood. You lose this catenary starting somewhere around 15, 20 knots. And by the time you have 40 knots of wind, you have no catenary. And you're totally dependent on this anchor, the angle formed by the road in, in the bottom. Uh, people like to say that, well, if they use all chain, that won't happen, but it does. At 40 knots, you have no catenary. And with a rope road, it happens sooner. So it's better to rely on a big enough anchor that will set in the bottom that'll handle 40, 50 knot winds than it will be hoping your chain. I don't care how much weight you put on this, uh, whether it's all chain, whether it's a uh, size or two bigger than the, the chart says you should have for your size boat, or if you use, I think he called it an anvil or a sentinel that you slide down to keep that at 40 knots, you've lost it. It's not there. And you have to rely on this angle being six degrees or less. You have to rely on the anchor being big enough to hold your boat. Great. Well, that was our final question. I, I have to say thank you so much, uh, Rudy uh, and Jill, for both of you for being here. Uh, this has been wonderfully informative. Uh, we really appreciate it at SSCA. And to all of you who attended and um, asked such great questions and really made this a fantastic workshop, we appreciate you. Uh, and uh, we'll follow up with some emails to all of the registrants. Hopefully, we'll be able to um, make the recording, if all went well with that, available to you. Um, and if you have any questions for Rudy, you see his uh, information here. And if you uh, have any questions or are interested about Seven Seas Cruising Association, check us out at www.ssca.org. We're always welcoming new members and uh, hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you so much, Rudy. Thank you, Cecilia. It's a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening.